Okay, let's get started. Uh, the last lecture we talked about the proximal proximal gradient method. Okay, and then in this lecture six, we are going to uh st study a very important technique. We call it acceleration technique. So basically, in the previous lectures, we have seen many different algorithms, and most of them are gradient based. And the key idea, the key step is basically, uh, for example, looking at this uh, proximal uh, gradient method. The key step is basically, uh, first, we do a standard gradient descent. Okay, so we work on this smooth objective function. And then we do a proximal mapping to address the, the potential non-smooth function, H. Okay. And this is a very simple uh, update rule. Based, based on xt, we will generate the next iteration xt plus one. Okay. And then in this lecture, we are going to see that there are some uh, very nice techniques that we can use to substantially accelerate the convergence speed of these algorithms. Okay. So the convergence will be like a hundred times faster, but the cost is marginal. Uh, we just need to compute the uh, one uh, very simple step and then the, uh, the entire algorithm will converge hundreds of times faster. So we will first, there are several acceleration techniques, but they are sort of uh, similar to each other. And we start from the heavy ball method. And then we look at the Nesterov's accelerating gradient and uh, how <coughs> further generalizes to the, to the proximal gradient method. And then we look, we will study the convergence analysis. Well, the algorithm may look very simple by adding one uh, one additional step, but turns out the convergence analysis is uh, highly non-trivial. And then we have some lower bounds to show the optim optimality of these uh, accelerated methods. So let's uh, uh, review uh, the complexity, the iteration complexity of these uh, gradient methods uh, and or the proximal gradient methods. So in the previous lectures, we showed that for strongly convex and smooth problems, uh, gradient method and proximal gradient method, their complexity is given by uh, this kappa times log one over epsilon. Well, this kappa is the condition number. This kappa is this L divided by mu. And L is the smoothness parameter of the function, and mu is the strong convexity parameter. So, so it is uh, only involves a log term that depends on the target accuracy. Right? So the complexity is very low, it's very low. However, for convex and smooth problems, right? If we, if we do not have strong convexity, this will increase to one over epsilon instead of log one over epsilon. And uh, so these are the complexities for the gradient methods or proximal gradient methods. So the question we want to look at is, can we still, can we further accelerate the convergence of these methods? Can we further reduce the complexity of these methods? And the the issue about a uh, gradient descent. So let let's look at gradient descent first because it is the simplest method that we have, uh, we have seen. So gradient descent all, only focuses on improving the objective function by leveraging the information from the previous iteration. Right. So every time based on x t we generate x t plus one. 
And sometimes this could be uh, too short-sighted because we are only leveraging the, the information from the previous iteration. There could be more information that we can leverage from the past history. And also, when the problem has a very bad condition number, uh, when this kappa is very big, the complexity, this complexity could be uh, very bad. It grows linearly with this kappa. So for ill conditioned problems, gradient descent will sometimes have a, this a zigzag issue. So the trajectory is zigzagging. And in that, set, in that case, the, the convergence would be very slow. And the high level idea of acceleration is to basically in the algorithm design, we, we, we can try to exploit more information that we have generated from the history. So we can try to leverage all the information from all the past iterations instead of just looking at the previous iteration. And this idea, the first, uh, uh, the first methods, uh, acceleration method developed based on this idea is uh, the heavy ball method developed by Poyak in 60s. And uh, the idea is very, actually very simple and it is inspired by physics. So now let's look at this uh, very simple minimization problem. We want to minimize uh, smooth and let's say a convex function effects. And this is the gradient gradient descent uh, uh, algorithm that we we are familiar with. A okay, very simple algorithm. Now this this heavy ball method basically adds an additional term, what we call the momentum term. Add such a momentum term to this uh, gradient gradient descent update. And what this momentum term does is simply adding the difference. Uh, between the previous two iterations to the update. Right? So it's xt minus xt minus one, the difference between the previous two iterations. And we add, we multiply it by some coefficient and add it to the, uh, to this gradient update. Now this, we call this momentum because it is like adding an inertial, uh, inertia to the ball to mitigate the zigzag. Okay, so I think we have, oh, we have a, don't have a, yeah, maybe we can look at this thing. So this is an ill conditioned uh, quadratic problem, like uh, which we have seen before when we talk about the gradient methods. Okay. We start from here and every time we follow the negative gradient, the trajectory will be uh, suffering uh, from this zigzag, zigzag issue. So the trajectory is zigzagging because the gradient, every time the gradient is only pointing towards a direction that is almost perpendicular to this uh, horizontal line. So it's a, and this will slow down the convergence of this method because of this, uh, because this problem has a very large condition number. This kappa is very large. Okay. Now, if we add this uh, momentum term to the update, now let's look at this illustration. So the first iteration, okay, we still do gradient descent because imagine uh, when t equals to zero, we don't have, we can set x zero and x negative one we can initialize both of them to be, uh, to be at the same, to be at the same point. Okay, so in the first iteration, we do not have this momentum term yet, so we just do a gradient descent. So we end up with the same trajectory. But then in the next, in the second, starting from the second iteration. <clears throat> now let's look at this one. This arrow is what, um, right. So the top arrow 
arrow. This is where the gradient descent points at. Okay, this is this is where the gradient descent points at. However, uh, in this uh heavy ball method, we will add this uh, momentum term, which is the difference between the previous two, and that difference is actually this this arrow. This is exactly the difference between the previous two iterations. So let's move let's move this arrow uh, to this point. Okay. So it's like gradient descent. This is gradient descent update. Add in this momentum term, we will end up with such an update. And you can see the by doing that, we are no longer zigzagging that much anymore. So it has a it can help suppress this uh, zigzagging issue yeah. intuitively. And if we keep doing that, we can see the trajectory is uh, much much more smooth and goes to the converges to the optimizer more quickly compared to the the figure shown shown in the above. Okay. So this intuitively this shows that adding such a momentum term can may may help accelerate the convergence of this algorithm. Now let's look at, uh, let's analyze this algorithm in a special problem, uh, this quadratic minimization problem. And here uh, we, so the setting is exactly the same as what we have uh, considered before. The Q, this Q is a square positive definite matrix. So the entire problem is strongly convex and smooth, a very nice problem. And let's say this Q matrix has a condition number kappa. So let, and we will try to analyze this heavy ball method by looking at its dynamics. So this equation, this is an equation uh, it's a vector equation, right? This this equation is about uh, it's, it's about the vector of two variables, x t and x t plus one. So this is a vector. We so we introduce this vector x t plus one x t, and then what we do is uh, we write this uh, momentum uh, this more heavy ball iteration. We rewrite this update into such a vectorized form because you see this update involves in t plus one it depends on the previous iteration and the iteration two two steps away right it depends on the previous two iterations so when we write when we rewrite this update in a vectorized form we need to introduce uh a dimension, an extra dimension. So this is like the vector at time t, and then this is like the vector at time t minus one because the all the uh, all the counters will be reduced by one, right? So x t plus one now becomes x t. T is t minus one, and then we will define this. Uh, this is a matrix square matrix, and this is a gradient. And this is zero vector. Okay. Now you can you can use just use linear algebra and check that this is exactly the the update rule of that momentum uh, heavy ball momentum method. Um. So what you do is just look at the first first row. X t plus one equals to now by matrix vector multiplication this one equals to the first row times this column right and then you if you compute that that is exactly so we can quickly compute it here 
So x t plus one is um, okay. I is an identity matrix times x t that simply gives x t. So it's one plus theta t times x t uh, minus theta t right, times x t minus one. Okay, and then we need this additional term minus eta t gradient f x t. And then you can combine just rearrange these terms. We have x t, this one minus eta t gradient f x t. Now the other two terms we can take theta t out. Okay, and this is exactly the heavy ball update rule. Exactly that same update rule. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, the second row is a redundant. Why? Because if you look at the second row, x t, now the right hand side is this one times this column. That is simply x t because it's just i times x t, and uh, minus zero, minus zero. Okay, so the second row is simply x t equals to x t, so redundant row. But we we can introduce this redundant row. So the entire system is a forms a dynamic system. Okay. So this system evolves over the iteration t, right? If you view this vector as a uh, some vector at time t, then this update rule says that. Uh, this system vector depends on the previous system vector. Okay, uh, sub uh, under a linear such a linear transformation, and then uh, add in such a con uh, such a gradient vector. So this is like a linear system evolving over time, right? And the and the system variable is x t plus one and x t. Therefore, the heavy ball, uh, the heavy ball method is essentially described by such a linear system, and then we can just uh, analyze this method using all the technical tools that we know about linear systems. Now, once we have this equation, uh, we can uh, here we add. Uh, we subtract the optim the minimizer at star. Okay, we can do this for free because it's just constant. You can verify that this doesn't mod it doesn't uh, change the system. And then we call this the state. This is the state of the system at time t. And the state vector. So the state vector simply characterizes that you can sort of. Uh, understand it as the the gap between your current uh, iterate and the minimizer. So the system state evolves over time following such a dynamic system. Now, okay, and then we will do one more step. The gradient of f. In this example, the gradient of f is given. Okay. For such a quadratic function, the gradient, this gradient is simply, we have done this before, it's simply q times x minus x star, which is again a linear term. So plug in this gradient, okay, plug in this gradient here, and then you can further combine 
all the terms on the right hand side. Uh, in the end, the right hand side can be simplified into a matrix vector form. So mat such a matrix times the, uh, the, the vector, the system state in the previous iteration. Now we let's copy this uh, equation here. So this 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 is a very standard uh, linear system. The state. This is the state of the system, and the state evolves over time based on this uh, system matrix H T. So this H T determines all the properties about uh, the dynamics of this system. And you can see this uh, HT depends on the problem Q. The problem matrix Q depends on the amount of momentum that we added to this, to the gradient update. Right? That, that is characterized by theta P. And because such a system is uh, given by a matrix vector multiplication form, right? So the next state is the matrix HT multiplied by the previous state. Therefore, the, uh, the dynamics of this system completely depends on the spectrum of the system matrix HT. So here the spectrum means the the singular values of this system. And the key idea is that is to find a proper step size eta t and the proper momentum theta t. Right? Because these are the only two parameters we can modify in this algorithm. To find to find the proper hyper, these two proper hyper parameters to control the spectrum of this matrix in a way that so that the entire system can converge very fast. Right? Because this matrix, the spectrum of this matrix is uh, only depends on these two parameters. And then the entire convergence of this system state, we want this state goes to zero, right? Because we want xt goes to x star. So we want to control the this matrix HT in a way so that the system state can quickly converge to zero. Right? And, the, and, the, and the only control knob we have is the theta T, momentum parameter theta T and the step size parameter eta T. So our key, uh, key step is to try to analyze the spectrum of this matrix and see how we can tune these hyperparameters to accelerate the convergence of this dynamic equation. And this is the <coughs> key theorem, key result. So suppose that uh, a quadratic function is L smooth and mu strongly convex. Now, given these two parameters, and and then let's choose the step size eta t in this way. It's four over square root of, of L plus square root of mu to the power of two. And let's add this much amount of momentum. So the theta t momentum parameter is given by this one. Okay. With this set up, we can show that the system, for this system equation, right? This is a system equation associated with the heavy ball method. For this equation, the state vector converges at the following rate. This is a state vector at time t. It is less than or equal to something diminishing to zero uh, geometrically fast and then multi multiplied by a constant uh, constant vector. This is basically the initialization, initial gap between x1 and x star and x0 and x star.
And the, the nice thing about this result, so let, let, let's first directly look at the implication of this result. The result says that, okay, if you pick for the heavy ball method, if you pick the step size and uh, inject the momentum properly, then this, this convergence, this vector, the distance to the optimizer vector converges geometrically fast. But we have, we have a similar result before when we analyzed gradient descent method. Right. But the difference is that the convergence, previously the convergence depends on Papa. Kappa minus one over kappa plus one. But now for the heavy ball method, if we choose the parameters in this way, the convergence only depends on square root of kappa. And uh, so if we set this to be epsilon, then for gradient descent, we need t equals to kappa log one over epsilon. This many iterations, we have done this before. But now for the heavy ball method, we only have square root of kappa. So if you set this to be epsilon and solve for t, you can check that you only get uh, square root of kappa in the iteration complexity. So comparing these two uh, iteration complexity, kappa versus square root of kappa. Because kappa is the condition number, it is usually, it is bigger than one. Okay. L over mu is bigger than one. And the in, in many cases, it's far bigger than one. Could be thousands or even tens of thousands. Okay, so basically, kappa for ill conditioned problems, kappa can be very large. And then for gradient descent, right, the convergence, uh, the, the complexity is very high. But for heavy ball methods, if we pick the right hyperparameters, the complexity only depends on the square root of this. Uh, uh, condition number, right? So imagine if, if kappa is 10 to the 6, then there's a huge difference between these two methods. Okay, so with this result, it, sh it shows that this heavy ball method can Im uh, substantially improve the, it re reduce the iteration complexity mm -hmm. of gradient descent. Basically, now it's square root of kappa versus kappa over the same. <clears throat> but to implement this method, like this is a theoretical result, but to implement this method, we have to choose, according to this statement, right, we have to choose such a step size and such a momentum parameter, which depends on the knowledge of L and mu. Okay, we have to know them beforehand. But it's okay because this result gives us a promising direction. It shows that simply adding a very simple momentum term, by right, simply adding this term can substantially improve, uh, can substantially accelerate convergence of the method. So there's a hope that we can develop a more comprehensive theory along this direction. And the proof, the proof is actually the high level idea is very straightforward. Uh, we just analyze the spectrum of this matrix. And after that, we can analyze the, uh, this linear system pretty easily.
So I will just describe the high level idea uh, of the proof. Yeah, okay. So uh, for the, so this, this Q matrix is the, the matrix in the problem, right? That the quadratic is a, is a matrix in that quadratic uh, objective function. And let's denote, uh, all, let's put all these eigenvalues into a diagonal matrix. So we call this lambda, big lambda matrix. Okay? Contains all the eigenvalues of this Q. Then the spectral radius of that matrix HT is basically given by this one. Okay, why if we look at, if I look at this equation, right? So simply uh, because everything else is identity matrix and they, this matrix are triangular, triangular blockwise, it's upper triangular matrix. So we we can show that by linear algebra we can show that the spectrum depends on such uh, the spectrum radius depends on the spectral radius of such a matrix. Well, uh, this this lambda is a diagonal matrix of this Q. And then. Right, and then uh, these are very big matrices because lambda is a big diagonal matrix, and this i are very also very big identity matrix. We can show that for such a matrix, the spectral radius is basically bounded by the maximum over i. Well, now we are only considering the spectral radius of such a two by two matrix. Okay. It's like uh, we are kind of we can kind of decompose all the all these lambdas into smaller matrix. Everything here will be just linear algebra. So in the end, we just need to uh, analyze the spectral radius of these two by two matrices, and then just we can just compute their uh, compute this number in a brute force way, just and. Uh, I think it's in the next page. Yeah. We just need to compute the eigenvalues of this two by two matrix. Just and then by definition, uh, the, they are the roots of this equation. Okay, and then everything is just calculation. Um, So the all the rest of the discussion is to sh is to um, show that if we choose theta t properly, right, if we pick this theta t in uh, properly in this way, then we will have uh, then the roots of this equation will have the magnitude of square root of theta. T. So in the end, once we choose this, uh, once we use this uh, theta t and plug it in, and then finally, once we choose this uh, special choice of uh, step size, then we can guarantee that the spectral radius of the uh, of that matrix H t is bounded by uh, this number. Kappa, square root of kappa minus one over square root of kappa plus one. And then the theta t can be also simplified in, in this form. Okay. So the idea is basically to calculate the, calculate the eigenvalue, analyze the eigenvalue of this uh, HT matrix, system matrix. So 
So this this result uh, shows that for the heavy ball method, for the heavy ball method, when we apply it to solve the quadratic problems, when we apply it to solve this quadratic problem, this type of quadratic problems, it is possible to choose a good momentum to inject a proper amount of momentum to the update so that the complexity of this method can be substantially reduced. Okay. So this is a very already a very good starting point. Uh, but the limitation is that all the discussion here is limited to such a quadratic problem. This is a very very small class of problems. We want to uh, we want to further study if this idea can be generalized to a broader class of functions. And this comes the nest rofs accelerated gradient methods. So the heavy ball method only can only be can only be shown to accelerate the convergence uh, in solving quadratic problems. For more general convex convex optimization problems or strongly convex problems, uh, it may not it may not be able to give us a otherwise better result. But Nestorov further developed another uh, acceleration scheme that can give us a better result. Yeah. So in the previous, uh, in the heavy ball method, we have shown this one. For a positive definite quadratic function, Injecting a proper amount of momentum to the gradient descent update can help us reduce the equation complexity. Okay. And can we can reduce from kappa log one over epsilon to square root of kappa. Uh, however, this only limits to the quadratic functions. So a, a very natural question is can we obtain such an improvement for more general uh, convex functions. And this is the, this scheme is given by uh, Nestorov in 1980s. Okay. The idea again is very similar to heavy ball, but it's a little bit different. Uh, the, and the algorithm is very simple actually. The first step, is a standard gradient descent. I suppose you start from yt, and the first line is basically gradient descent on yt. And then let's call that xt plus one, not yt plus one. Let's call this intermediate update xt plus one. And then the yt plus one is basically xt plus one plus this momentum term. Uh, again, we are just injecting a very simple momentum to the intermediate update, okay? So yt plus one is, xt plus one is, is this uh, outcome of the gradient uh, update plus a momentum term, okay? So you can see implementing these algorithms are very trivial. Even in your code, you just add one extra line of interpolation. Okay, so this the second line is just a very simple addition of vectors, and this momentum coefficient is uh, time varying it's t over t plus three time varying. But but any but in any case, it is uh, somewhat very similar to the heavy ball method, right? just by just inject, just inject a momentum to the to the update, but they are, they are technically different. Why? Because uh, if you look at the momentum, let's go back to the momentum update. You see, 
every uh, okay now everything on the right hand side are about x xt 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 minus one okay now if you look at the this one if you plug in xt plus one to the second line on the right hand side you have yt yt but xt plus one xt so you have different variables but in the heavy ball you have the same variable so this uh the way we add momentum in the master of algorithm is different from the heavy ball and this small difference uh can can help us can make the theory more general, basically. So the, the nice thing about this algorithm is that every iteration takes nearly the same cost as gradient descent, because the main computation would be in the first line where you compute the gradient. The second line is a trivial step. And later on, we will see that this is not a monotonically descent method. So the function value may not may not monotonically decrease. That's it. It's different from gradient descent. It may have oscillations, but overall it is faster. <clears throat> and we can look at the result the convergence rate of this method uh, first without without getting into the proof suppose f is convex and l smooth and uh, suppose we pick such a step size okay. uh, these settings are exactly the same as the gradient descent gradient descent method right? for convex and smooth problems we for gradient descent we also pick this step size now, we choose all these parameters. Then for convex and smooth problems, the accelerated gradient descent uh, uh, method, uh, this method, this method converges at this rate. The function value gap decays at the rate one over t squared. It's about one over t squared, ignoring the constants. So for convex and smooth problems, right? For gradient descent, we know that the convergence rate is uh, one over t. But for accelerated gradient descent, this result shows that it converges at one over t squared. And again, this is a big difference. If you run 1,000 equations, gradient descent gives you about 10, negative three accuracy. This one is one over 1,000 to the power of two. So that gives you 10 to the negative six accuracy, right? So this is a huge difference, but the extra cost is uh, it's almost zero. Uh, because the algorithm is just uh, adding, uh, introducing an extra uh, interpolation step. Almost no extra cost. <clears throat> Why is there a t plus three in that? Oh, the red. t plus three, yeah. This this is something very mysterious. Uh, when When this method was constructed, yeah, this is a magic number. Somehow choosing to look at the the red coefficient, right? Choosing this coefficient um can make the proof work. And we will see, we probably will see some some uh, explanations uh for this co for how to choose this coefficient. And again, it is inspired by physics. I probably uh, deleted those parts in this version, uh, but we will see. 
Yeah, and choosing this coefficient is critical. It's critical. It's not something that comes out random. We will also see how 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 it uh, determines the proof later. Okay, so it, therefore, for this one, right, the <clears throat> the iteration complexity is one over epsilon. Now, if you set this to be epsilon, so for t is one over epsilon, but for accelerated gradient descent is one over the square root of epsilon because of that square. Then, so this is a much faster convergence rate and much lower iteration complexity. Yeah. And the uh, here is a numerical example, mm. and we have we have done this in one of the homeworks. Uh, I I think that that's probably a little bit different, but yeah, it's a numerical example. We use this log sum exponential loss function, and uh, the data set is a uh, to 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 fit this linear observation model. Okay. And we can here we compare this uh, the convergence of these two methods gradient descent is the blue curve and this vista is what it's, it's a different method but this you can you can just understand it as that Nesterov's acceleration method okay and it, we can we can see that now the x axis is the number of iterations and the blue curve is what we typically get like in many of the homework problems in your simulations, we always get such a smooth uh, de decreasing curve for gradient descent. Now the y-axis is the gap, function value gap, but it's in the log scale. So it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's not a normal linear scale, it's a log scale. And you can see that in the log scale, uh, the red, the accelerated method, the red curve, decays very fast. Okay, quickly we can quickly jump to 10 to the negative six. But the gradient method somehow stops at 10 to the negative two. So the convergence is very slow. Okay. So this shows that if you inject a little bit momentum to the gradient updates, you can make a huge difference. Okay, so this is the method for the, so this is the accelerated algorithm for minimizing a single uh, smooth function. And we can extend this to uh, com composite models, okay. basically by adding that proximal, uh, proximal idea. The setup is very sim similar to the proximal uh, gradients uh, method. We are considering minimizing a composite uh, function. Fx is differentiable, smooth, uh, convex and smooth. H is convex, but may not be differentiable. So the same setup. And then <clears throat> for, for this method, for, for solving this problem, uh, in the previous lecture, we introduced the proximal gradient method, but this method has an accelerated accelerated version called the FISTA, uh, developed by Beck and the Tafuli in 2009. And this algorithm, again, looks very similar to the accelerated, the next growth accelerated, accelerated algorithm but it has an extra proximal method to handle the non-smooth space. The idea is exactly the same. The first line, okay, because now we are solving such a composite problem. So the first line, we just do a standard proximal gradient update. That's gradient descent, 
followed by approximal mapping. Just a standard proximal gradient mapping. And then the second line is where we inject the momentum. Yt plus one is the previous xt plus one, adding an additional momentum term, right? The same idea, adding a momentum term. And then again, there are some magic number in this coefficient. Uh, here, the coefficient is, is given by theta t minus one over theta t plus one. Well, the sequence of theta t is given by such a uh, equation. Okay, theta t plus one equals to the whatever on the right hand side. So basically, even theta zero equals to one, you can get theta one. Even theta one, you can get theta two. Okay, so you can calculate this sequence numerically one by one. And once you have that, plug them in to this expression. Okay, and uh, if you ask me why this why this method, this coefficient is chosen in such a specific form. Well, we will see it in the proof, but it's hard to explain them intuitively here. But in practice, okay, in practical applications, you can simply ch choose a fixed constant. You can put a fixed constant in front of this momentum term. Okay. So again, if you look at this uh, implementation of this algorithm, it, it is also very simple. Essentially, the first line is the proximal gradient update. The second line is trivial by just a vector addition. So though this theta t, we can just calculate them numerically. It's like given this scalar equation, it's very simple to calculate them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this figure shows that the theta t that these two authors constructed for this method, right? So this theta t is almost the same as almost the same as t over t plus three, <coughs> but they are slightly different, but almost the same. And uh, we can just look at verify this uh, numerical figure. Um. Uh, Yeah, just look at the right figure. Just look at the right figure. Yeah. The orange one is t over t plus three used in the accelerated that's all the accelerated method. The blue one is uh the, the one we just seen constructed by that complicated nonlinear equation, whatever it is. Blue blue uh, the blue curve is theta t minus one minus minus one over theta t. This is the coefficient used in front of the uh, momentum term. Uh, you can see, as, as in top of it, they are almost the same with each other. Once t goes to infinity. They're only slightly different at the very beginning. Right? As in top of it, they are the same. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so these are our metric numbers. Right, and I think we can. I, I will leave the convergence next to the next lecture, but but we can just quickly look at. Yeah, we can stop here and look at the homework problem.
Yeah, homework seven would be very simple. And I think you can, you can finish homework seven in less than 10 minutes based on what you developed in the previous homeworks. The essentially, I'm asking you to implement uh, heavy ball and the uh, next drops acceleration method to solve the previously developed problems. Uh, the, this this means we are problem that you 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 generated in the previous homework problems. Okay. Uh, so what you do is to simply uh, everything is you can just copy the code. You reuse the code previously, the same problem, for example. But now you are using this uh, heavy ball. No, now you are using this uh, nest drops accelerated gradient descent method even below. Okay. Now what you do is in your code you just add one extra line. Okay, just add one extra line. And then here I'm asking you to try different uh, momentum coefficients. The theta k, you can choose the theoretically guided uh, theta k, which is k over k plus three. Or you can set theta k to be a constant. And the, the other case is theta k you set theta k to, to zero, meaning that you do not inject any momentum to the method. In that case, the algorithm reduces to gradient descent. Uh, when theta k equals to zero, y k plus one equals to x k plus one. So it's essentially gradient descent. So you just uh, implement this method and then report this uh, results. The simulation too is the same idea, but we are looking at this uh, compressed sensing problem that we uh, that we see in homework six. So again, you can reuse the problem that you generated in homework six. And then the algorithm we use is the accelerated proximal gradient method. In homework six, we were we were using proximal gradient as only proximal gradient method. So now I'm asking you to add this momentum momentum term to this up to your update. And again, uh, you can choose different set of case and compare their performance. Yeah, this is essentially the Two simul yeah, the two simulations for homework seven. <clears throat> Got a question on the lecture. Mm -hmm. So you were telling us that um, the two methods, uh, there's the T over T plus three, and then there's the other one, which is the um, T, T, well, it's the theta of T minus one minus one over theta of T. That, yeah, could you swap them? Like if they're equivalent at um, higher numbers, higher numbers of iterations, mm -hmm. can't you just swap the two? Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. I think in practice you can you can do that. It's it's very flexible. It's very yeah. When you try these homeworks, you will see that normally you can you can choose a very flexible uh, momentum problem, and uh, yeah, there's a wide range of choice of parameters that can accelerate the algorithm. But in theory, uh they have to be different, uh, I think. Yeah, I think in theory, there are different versions of proof and they may, I think both of them will work. Yeah, both of them will work, but uh, the, for example, this one, it looks more complicated, but it is actually easier to analyze in theory because because of the because the structures are very are more clear, but for the previous uh, t over t plus three, it's just like something randomly come up, 
and uh, no one understands why it has to be like that. So this is this one's more mysterious. Yeah, I think let's see if we if we have some. Yeah, I may have something in the old version that can <clears throat> give some it give some uh intuition. So we have fifteen minutes. So yeah, this this coefficient, this momentum coefficient is particularly mysterious. P over T plus three. Which is one minus three over t. Uh, wait, is it? It's, it's not. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, it's the same. So this can be. I mean, there's a reason. Yes, there are some studies that uh, tries to connect that coefficient to a. Uh, Physics system. Uh, well, let's see if we can explain this clearly. So consider such a system. And uh, we have a We have a spring force, which is basically a negative gradient. It's like a constant force added to this uh, object. And we have time varying damping force, which is negative three over tau. Uh, and I think what they did is First of all, write, writing down the uh, Newton's, I guess this is, uh, I don't know, I forgot all everything about physics, but I guess this is something like the Newton's equation for this system. Uh, this is the acceleration, the second order derivative of x tau. This is the, uh, the first order derivative uh, x tau, and this is the gradient of f at x tau. Now, and what they did is they are trying to map Nesterov's accelerated gradient update into, map that update to such a differential equation, ordinary differential equation. So they have some similarities. For example, we can write Nesterov's update rule uh, equivalently in this discrete form. Okay, they are, you can check just by calculation, right? they are equivalent. And uh, then we are trying to push this. Make, so this is a discrete equation, but we can make it continuous by uh, introducing these uh, select variables. Okay, so by making the discrete time continuous, uh, each term can be approximated by the derivative and the second order derivative. So the left-hand side is a discrete. There's difference in the discrete time and that can be approximated. Once we push this time to the continuous limit, it can be approximated by these uh, deriv higher order derivatives. And uh, once you plug them into the previous equation, okay, and uh, simplify, you end up with this ODE, ordinary differential equation. And this ODE can be interpreted as such a physics system. Okay. I think that that's the high level picture. That's the high level picture. And the question is, 
Now the the mysterious thing is that because of that special choice, uh, t over t plus three, that will lead lead to such a specific coefficient in the first order derivative term. Right. That t over t plus three will lead will result in such a coefficient. Now, why is this special? Um, so first of all, based on such an ODE equation, uh, there are some standard ODE theory that can show that such an ODE uh, converges at one over tau square, which explains Nesterov's convergence rate result, which is O about one over T square. Moreover, there, so we can go through this analysis, uh, this Lyapunov analysis, and uh, you, you can find that this number three is the smallest constant that guarantees guarantees that the ODE system converges at one over tau squared. Okay. So therefore, right, in the original choice, well, Nesterov picks T over T plus three. And that specific choice gives the number three here. And the number three is the smallest constant that can guarantee such a quadratic. Uh, one over tau square convergence. So in some sense, right, that choice is uh is um the right choice to make to make the entire system to be uh to make the entire system to converge at such a convergence rate. All right, so so this three minimizes the pre constant in the convergence bound. So basically, choosing t over t plus three makes the entire system more co more efficient. Yeah, or put it another way, if you choose like eight or t over t plus eight, and then that will probably lead to a different constant coefficient here, and then which can potentially uh, destroy, like modify the dynamics of this system, and then the convergence rate would be different. Right? So that that that's why uh, this uh, choice of a uh, momentum coefficient is is uh, is still is still mysterious even uh, as of now. People are still looking at uh, some uh, some interpretations of this choice. Yeah, but this is one of the one of the nice interpretations. Well, they can connect the nest swaps out there to uh, ODE, and this ODE ODE uh, can be interpreted by such a physics system. Yeah, because this. Uh, Many optimization methods are essentially connected to physics, physics equations. Uh, because the negative gradient is basically a force. And then the trajectory is, is essentially like, like a moving object under a certain, certain type of force. Yes, yeah, so, so it's very interesting that uh, the theory that we are looking at in this course has also has close connections to physics, to control systems, and uh, to many other areas. Okay, so I think Yeah, I think I can. I will stop here today, and uh, you can 
once you finish uh, homework six, you can just quickly modify your codes and uh, complete homework seven. The homework seven is about accelerating, uh, applying accelerated algorithms. Okay. And if you have any questions about the uh, compressed sensing simulation in homework six, uh, feel free to talk to me. Okay. All right, so I will stop here and uh, see you guys on Thursday.